I think I'm done using broadband light pollution filters. Uh, I'm going to stick to using UV, IR cut, and dual narrowband filters and just call it a day. And I realize that's a strong statement to start with, and I do hope to explain myself over the course of this video. Now, just recently, I've been doing some experimentation, shooting with just simply a UV, IR cut filter, no traditional broadband light pollution filtration whatsoever, and quite simply back to back. I've taken my favorite pair of images that I've ever taken since Stein Astronomy. Um, and it just doesn't seem like it can be coincidence that it's all happened at the same time as I've switched to testing out just shooting unfiltered, right? So I think it's something I should learn from, perhaps investigate a little deeper and carry forward. And I hope to, with tonight's imaging session, hopefully uh, make it a hat trick, catch a third personal favorite uh it's looking good already i have to say from the previous sessions that i've stacked but more on that later but i think it is uh, now a, a turning point for me and you're probably wondering well why you know what are you talking about what's changed quite simply i think it's the switch in my local kind of situation to led street lamps and i can already hear the comments being typed out there undoubtedly but luke what are you talking about? LEDs are broadband, and you're quite right. Uh, of course they are, but they also have some serious advantages of, over what we used to have here in this location. So previously, we were using high-pressure sodium lamps, as you'd find nearly all over the UK. I don't know what it's like in other countries, but um, every night in the UK, everywhere you drove, just bathed in that familiar kind of orange glow. Everywhere. Now they had a good point in that because it was a very, you know, distinct colour, it also fell on a very distinct segment of the bandwidth for visible light. So it was able to be filtered out, right? You were cutting out a little bit of the light that you wanted from a broadband source, but I think the cost uh, of losing that little bit of signal that you wanted was, was worth it for getting rid of all of that light pollution. The thing that wasn't so good about sodium street lamps is that the shielding on them was non-existent, effectively. I can't be alone in this, but I remember many a foggy night, you know, a misty morning or whatever, before the street lamps go off. Looking at a street lamp and seeing the cone of light that they're emitting being quite clearly just drawn out for you there, as plain as day. And you can see that, yes, lots of the light's falling downwards, but also lots of it's just going straight upwards in a V around the top of the lamp. Really clear to see that a lot of light leaving those lamps was heading straight up into the atmosphere and illuminating it unimpeded, unreflected. Now, this thing that has happened recently, like I say, we switched to kind of LED street lamps and I've noticed that I think my backyard is now, as a result, darker because the shielding on them is so much better. I don't need to sleep with the blinds down anymore because, you know, there isn't a street lamp shining literally directly into my eyes all night long. Instead, I could have the curtains open and everything if I wanted to give the neighbors a show. Not that I'm like that, but <laughs> all the same. And also, you know, on a, on a, like I say, a misty morning, a foggy night, you can, you can really see what's going on. You can see a quite a clear puddle of light falling underneath those LED street lamps. So any light that actually starts going up into the atmosphere has first had to be reflected off the ground. And you don't need me to explain to you that the ground isn't like a mirror, you know what I mean? It's not 99% reflective. In fact, it's not very reflective at all. That's why it gets so hot on a summer's day, for example. You know, it, it's, it's a very dark color. So it reduces the, the amount of intensity of light that actually does make its way back up, even if it is a broadband source. And I reckon that this is probably a changing situation that's happening all over the country at different times. I know many people, particularly uh, in our country, at least down south, uh, got LED street lamps installed years ago and probably the shielding on those wasn't so good but we were late to the party and as such we ended up with I think probably better units and maybe you have too um, and it could absolutely be worth your time to do an experiment with this and check it out for yourself which is what I intend to do over the course of uh, tonight and the coming sessions undoubtedly whenever the moon's not up basically I want to continue along with this and just see how it turns out. Now then guys, we're up and running. Uh, I've actually gathered a few frames already on VDB 152. And uh, it's looking alright. We had some passing clouds going through the frame, uh, as evidenced by, let's say if I choose one of these kind of brighter 
frames right here with a higher mean value you can see around these bright stars if i just zoom in a touch you can see a degree of dispersion around them that's a dead giveaway uh that this thing cloud's been passing through if i choose one from earlier in the night you should see all that sure enough go like that as you can uh, hopefully see so i will be ruthlessly culling any and all bad subs i can't be uh, afforded to stack any bad data whatsoever with something that's going to need to be stretched as aggressively as this thing is you know what i mean um the reason i'm mentioning that is because i have had some messages asking uh, you know how do you go through and uh, sort out which of your data you're actually going to stack and the answer is I go through manually by eye and sort every single frame uh, that seems to give the most consistent results i'll definitely keep things in that have got satellite trails and plane trails and things like that as long as they're not too ruinously bright as invariably they are removed during stacking as long as you're using a, uh, a outlier rejection method when you're stacking which you should always be doing generally speaking um but other than that i use asi fits viewer and go through everything now enough on that, um, as you can see this is my session and this is really what it's going to look like uh, as the night goes on so I won't dwell on that really anymore. I uh, stacked up the previous two sessions of data and came up with this. This is about three and a half hours of usable data uh, stretched to within an inch of its life admittedly um, but <laughs> you know that's what you need to do I guess and it still looks all right you know what I mean. I, even if I couldn't get any more data and I had to sell for this, I, I would be more than happy to sell for this. Because as I've mentioned just a few months ago, this kind of thing would not have been possible. I know there's a lot of other factors that have changed for me locally just recently, such as my new telescope, you know, the Celestron Rasa, which is monstrously fast, is undoubtedly an advantage when trying to make captures of this nature. But I've had fast telescopes before and never made captures like this. Um, the other thing that's changed, of course, is the software suites that I have access to, such as, uh, you know, Pixinsight and my level of proficiency with it now, um, being slightly higher than the zero point, which it was at before. And also the wonderful tools from Russell Croman, you know what I mean? Um, Blur Exterminator, Star Exterminator, Noise Exterminator, they help me push my images further than ever before. And, um, you know, I do have affiliate links for those, by the way, just putting it out. <laughs> But all the same, even before I did, I shouted those things out regularly. Just a blooming fantastic. I can't imagine processing without them, to be quite honest with you. I wouldn't want to. They've added to my fun that much. So um, all the features that I wanted to capture anyway, they're all present. They're all here, even in this image as it stands. Now, for final framing up of this thing, I used Telescopius until I had a set of coordinates that I was happy with. I should just show you... Uh, Kinda, this is what I was looking at right here. These two stars, just on the edge of the field of view. I wanted the dark rift and nebulosity coming in from near the corner. So it looks like it's leading in from one edge. I wanted that faint wisp of HA to be going off out of one side. I wanted to capture, perhaps most importantly of all for me, that planetary nebula remnant right there. Uh, that's you know really rich in HA, O3, as you would expect. And I think it's just a beautiful feature to have in this image and uh, lucky to say, you know, I have captured it already. Of particular interest, I think, as well, was this very faint white dust up here, which also has been captured. Um, if I just go back off this one second here yeah, and show you the image, it's all there, you know, it's all present and correct. I'm really pleased. I just hope I can add some more time to this. Now, I did wonder... You know, is it possible to shoot other things that have previously been impossible? And Chloe wondered the same thing. So just recently she's made a, as yet incomplete, she's still adding time to this uh, shot of the Ghost Nebula using the Quattro at F4. Again, with a one-shot color camera. And sure enough, there it is. The Ghost and the Goblins and the Bat. All present, all visible in just a couple of hours. Again, stretched to all buggery, but it's there. It's visible. Uh, and this is something that just wasn't ever doable before. We have tried this target, never really had any luck. So um, <laughs> who knows what's going on? I think it's the light pollution situation uh, as well as the processing situation that's changed. But whatever it is, I'm a happy guy uh, because it's opened up more of the universe to me than ever before. Right from here in my backyard and who could say... Uh, you know, who could say no to that? It's a fantastic situation to find yourself in. Now, 
That's about it from me, guys, I reckon. I'm going to continue on shooting this thing until uh, the night is done, however it ends. And I'll just leave it at that and wish you a very, very happy next session, whenever it may be, hopefully sooner rather than later for you guys out there. I know uh, Canada's still struggling with the uh, wildfires. I hope that that situation uh, rectifies itself very rapidly indeed. Uh, but there we have it, guys. That's what I'm trying to shoot. Hopefully I'll have a nice image for you at the end. And as always, I always want to say it, thank you for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you out there. I really, really do. Um, you know, your time and support means more to me than you could probably realize. Uh, or that I could articulate through a video like this. So, uh, yeah, thank you. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. And until then, close guys.